Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship at West Guilford Baptist Church. Welcome to those watching online. I am the lead pastor here at West Guilford Baptist, Pastor Sean. My wife is Amy. She's the minister of pastoral care. Together, we make one pastor or pastoral petition. Uh, it's wonderful to have you worshiping with us this morning. Sorry, I'm a little late. I just, uh, we get talking at the back, and the next thing you know, someone's going like this. It's time to go, Sean. Uh, okay, we do have some announcements this morning. Uh, first of all, Kingdom Prayer Time continues tomorrow. Very big turnout uh, this, this Monday of uh, prayer warriors here uh, this past Monday. So please consider coming to Kingdom Prayer Time. Wonderful time of sharing. It's a little bit of worship uh, and then a really powerful time of prayer. It's a ministry that Amy heads up along with a few others. Uh, we do have some study groups that are, that are rolling on, men's Bible studies. The Barnabas Men's Group uh, meets here from 9.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. at West Guilford Baptist. That is a partnership ministry with Lakeside. Uh, Women of the Word is Wednesday mornings at 9.15 to 11.45, so you notice you can drop your wife off, come here, leave, and then go pick your wife back up at, at Lakeside. That's... Uh, the Lord worked it out like that, along maybe, I think, with a couple people looking at the, uh, looking at the schedule. Uh, there is a men's breakfast, the 21st of uh, January. We don't have it up there, but the, oh, there it is, 21st of January at 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Um, now, last time it said there was bacon, but there was no bacon. Is there bacon this time? Because you tell, you tell a Turner there's going to be bacon. Yeah. <laughs> Kidding, joking aside, I actually took Clark, and Clark's going to be coming back with me next uh, for this one here. It was fantastic, great time together. So please come to that. That is at Lakeside Church. Uh, it is a combined men's ministry uh, between our two churches, and uh, that's exciting time to go do that. Uh, we have a deacons meeting tomorrow here at one. Uh, we will be opening the meeting. We have to to deal with a few things out of our nominating committee, so it'll be closed for about five to ten minutes. But after we've uh, dealt with the stuff from our nominating committee. Uh, you're welcome to join us. We're talking about the budget. So it's going to be super exciting if you want to come out and, and take part in the deacons meeting, which takes us to our next couple of announcements. First of all, Congregational Potluck Blessing Lunch uh, is following the service on January 29th. Talk to Carla. Wave your hand around back there, Carla. Carla's at the back. Uh, it is soup and sandwiches. Say, they asked, is it okay if you have soup and sandwiches, Pastor Sean? I said, yes, but they need to be cut like diagonally because I like little quarter sandwiches. So that's the only rule that I put forward for, for that. But soup and sandwiches, talk to Carla. Carla may not be there, and I'm putting that back up. Like she must have been in New York City. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, but following that, this is our first official announcement. According to the Constitution, we need to announce twice before the annual general meeting that we will be having an annual general meeting. So we'll have the service, the pot lock, or pot, the pot blessing, and then we'll have the annual general meeting for those who want to stay for that. Um, so that's our first announcement, annual general meeting, January 29th, following the pot blessing. Along with that, the deacons have uh, asked me to put out a call for new members. Uh, we've had some requests as far as we have a, a number of adherents, people who are coming and worshiping with us, some folks asking about membership in the church. So if you are interested in membership uh, over the next month or so, we would love to, to talk to you about what that looks like. We're going to have a meeting and just talk about what membership looks like at West Guilford Baptist Church. But along with that, a call for baptism. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you have not been baptized, friend, you must be baptized. The Lord calls you to it. So I'm going to invite you to talk to me as well about membership and about baptism. So please come and talk to me. Uh, that'll be a wonderful conversation to have with you. Uh, one more announcement. I'm not going to talk about our book study. I'll talk about it in the sermon. We are having Sorting Decoration Day happening on Wednesday at 1. Um, if you want to be involved with that, please talk to Steph. So at 1 o'clock on Wednesday, Steph's in the middle there. She waved her hand around. Um, they're just going to bring the boxes out here into, the, into the, uh, the lobby area and kind of sort through and see what we have and see what we need to add to. I'm going to ask the worship team to please come forward uh, while I start us with our call to worship. Okay. call to worship is from Psalm 96, 1 to 4. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. 
For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Loving Father, Holy God, what a wonderful morning it was to wake up to that sun. It was a crisp morning, Lord God, and, and it's, a, it's a cold day, but your sun shone through and lightens our hearts. And I just was reminded, Lord God, as I drove and I saw snowmobile trails on the lakes and I saw ice huts popping up, Lord God, that we live in a winter wonderland here in Halliburton. We give you thanks for that, Lord God. We recognize the many blessings that you have bestowed upon the people of West Guilford Baptist Church and upon the people of Halliburton. We recognize it, Lord, and we thank you and we praise you. We return thanks, Lord God, and we praise you for that. We ask, Lord God, that you would inhabit the praises of your people. We would feel your presence as we worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. Come, Holy Spirit, upon the people of West Guilford Baptist Church. Fill this room, Lord God, with the, the knowledge of your presence. Help us, Lord God, even in our sinful natures, to worship you and give you the worship that you're due, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, for the other churches this morning that are worshiping, the Bible-believing churches that are worshiping this morning. Uh, I pray, Lord God, for Minden Bible Church right now. Pray for Pastor Doug, who's preaching the word there. We pray for their vitality. We pray for their growth. We pray for any newcomers that are there, Lord God, hearing your gospel for the first time. We pray that the gospel would go forward through that church and through their ministry. We pray for a blessing on them, even as we experience it, Lord God, here. We all worship the same Lord. We, we, we read from the same Bible. We preach the same gospel. So we pray for them as we do all the other Bible-believing churches, uh, spirit-filled churches in this area. Uh, it's on my heart now to pray for Kyle Young, Lord God, young man who has decided to step out of his job and step into ministry through Youth for Christ here in Halliburton. We pray, Lord God, that you would give him a strong and mighty vision for the youth of this county and for the churches in the area to grab hold of that vision and to support him and his team in their ministry. We pray for Kyle, Lord God. We pray for generous hearts at this time amongst the Christians in this area as food prices go up, as fuel prices go up. Some people are making very hard decisions, Lord God. Some people with very young families we're hearing are making very hard decisions about where their dollars are going. We pray, help us to be generous, to give to the food bank, and to, to give to those areas of need that you would be glorified and the people you love would be cared for, Lord God. We pray for the needs of the world. There are so many. There's a plane crash that's happened in Nepal. We pray for those who have been, have been rushing to the, to, to, to the aid of everybody involved and for the families who have lost loved ones. We continue, Lord God, to pray for Ukraine. Uh, we just hear about the loss of more civilian lives there, Lord God. Uh, you know the answer to that complex situation, Lord. Even those of us who've done planning and have worked uh, with NATO uh, with, with regards to Ukraine understand how complex, Lord God, that situation is. You know it. You're bigger. We just lay it at your feet and ask, Lord God, for peace, especially for the people on the ground. We also recognize, Lord God, that tomorrow is January 16th. Uh, it is it is uh, traditionally known as Blue Monday. And we, we, it just reminds us, Lord God, that there is a growing concern of mental health in our culture. And there is a growing concern of depression and anxiety amongst the people you love. We pray, Lord God, uh, for everybody in our church, in our community, help us to recognize those with, within our church, Lord God, who maybe just need a call or an encouragement. Help us to remember to do that this week to lift one another up, even as we also keep an eye at the, on the people around us to speak your truth and your love into their lives uh, through, uh, through this, this winter time work on. We have a few requests that have come through our prayer team, but also through our pastoral team here, Lord God. Uh, we pray for Yvonne Gazelle, who has not been feeling well. She's asked for continued prayers around that, Lord God. We pray for healing for Yvonne. We pray continue to uphold Wanda Evans, Lord God. Uh, help her in her time of loss, and our pastoral team as they support her. We pray for our Sunday school orientation, Lord God, that is happening tomorrow. Uh, thank you, Lord God, for all those who have decided you are calling them to minister to our young people here at West Guilford Baptist. And we pray for that training, that it would be fruitful, and you'd give a good vision, Lord God, uh, for the care and the upbringing of our young people. Uh, we continue to pray, Lord God, for, uh, we pray for Dev Vasilitis, and that uh, she can get the amiogram that she needs, but also for her protection, John, because she's not well. 
And we pray that he would not get the illness that she has because he does have other underlying issues there, Lord God. And we pray for Deb herself, not for, that, that she would be healed, Lord God, by your, your precious hand, Lord God. And we just uphold the next month of meetings. You call us, Lord God, together as a people supporting one another in ministry. And part of that, Lord God, we even see in the book of Acts are the meetings that they had to have. And we have to as well. So we pray, Lord God, for our deacons meeting tomorrow. And we pray, Lord God, uh, for our annual general meeting that you prepare our hearts for that. All these things, Lord God, we lay at your feet, at the precious feet of your son, Jesus Christ. We lay it at the cross and just recognize, recognize, Lord God, it's all you. It's all you working through us. And we ask that you continue to do so. In your holy and precious name we pray. Oh,
going to come from the book of Acts, chapter 13, starting at the 13th verse. That's Acts, chapter 13, starting at the 13th verse. Paul and Barnabas at Antioch in Pisidia. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga at Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and, motioning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the, great, the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt, and with uplifted arm he led them out of it. And for about 40 years he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave to them their land as an inheritance. And this took about 450 years. And after that he gave them judges until the Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man from the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, 
who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me is one is, one is coming, and the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him, nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found him not worthy of guilt of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up, come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God has promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as it was written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that, I raised, that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purposes of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known that to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and that by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what Paul what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light to the Gentiles, that you might bring salvation to the ends of the earth." And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many who were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading through the whole region. But the Jews incited devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out from their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. May God bless us at the reading of his word. Let's stand together and sing Jesus all for Jesus. This song can be a challenge because we want to mean what we say, but all is a lot. <laughs> and so it can also, this song can also be a prayer too that God would enable us to really mean that yes, I want to give my all for Jesus. Let's sing together.
Sunday school with, is it you, Amy? Yes. Yeah, you, need, you probably need this. Yep. <laughs> Let's pray. Loving Father, I pray for your Holy Spirit to speak through me, uh, and that only the truth would be spoken, and only the truth would be heard. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Uh, I have terrible news this morning. Terrible news. I used to have 13 point on my sermon when I was reading through it, and I have had now to go to 16 point <laughs> in order to read my sermon correctly. I found for the last few weeks I was sitting here like this going through, so it was either this or my reading glasses, and I'm not there yet. <laughs> I'm bringing my reading glasses into the pulpit. So it happens to all of us. I'll, I'll, if I need them, Jim, I'll grab them from you. <laughs> so we've been looking at Roman history uh, quite a bit lately. The book of Acts is a book of history, so I've had to be brushing back up on some of my Roman history as we've gone along, and I came across an interesting factoid uh, this week that has to do with the word sincere. The word sincere actually comes to us from the Romans, it comes to us from the Roman Empire, uh, one of the most sought-after treasures in Roman times were Greek sculptures like this. Uh, either bronze like that, or sometimes they were cement, sometimes they were rock. The really good ones were of marble. If they were a marble sculpture, you were, were really rich. So the upper-class Romans, they couldn't get enough of these kinds of sculptures. But the sculptures themselves, by the time Rome came along, a lot of the Greek sculptures were 100, 200, sometimes 300 years old. And over that time, things get chipped, they get broken. And many of them were damaged, or many of them were cracked. But there was such a hunger for these sculptures that there were, um, there were some dealers who were a little bit unscrupulous. And what they do is they go along and they'd, they'd, they found that if they used wax, they could form the wax and they could put it on his nose and make it look like it was pristine and then send it into Rome. But the problem is, while it was sitting in your foyer, they probably had a foyer. If they were rich enough to have that, they probably had a foyer. Uh, if it was sitting there, over time, the wax would start to turn yellow. And you would start to notice, perhaps, I, you can't see it on here, but there's a little bit of a yellow spot down there. Uh, I think that might be a little bit of wax that's on that sculpture. Uh, but you start to notice that they're damaged and inauthentic, this thing that maybe you've paid first full price for. So after a while, there was a mark that officials would put on undamaged sculptures. And what it would say is, Sina Sere, without wax. And so you knew that this was the true thing. So that's where we get the word sincere from. It's genuine, there's no filler, and it's not cleaned up with a thin veneer. This week, friends, we are talking about having a sincere relationship with God. Last week I talked about prayer. This week I want to take us a little deeper, more than we just want to be a praying church. What might that look like? How do we start this idea? This week we're talking about having sincere relationship with God. Our big idea, sincere prayer brings our real selves before God. Real sincere prayer brings our real selves before God. The depth of our salvation is that we have come, as sinners, we can come to God as his children. You don't have to pretend everything's okay every time you come before God. 
nor should you. Because the Holy Spirit wants to sanctify you and wants to sanctify me in the places where we need it the most. God wants you to be sincere. Get rid of the wax. That's what we're talking about this morning. So if you want to turn to Acts 13, it's a long reading, uh, which I apologize for, but it's one narrative. I didn't want to break it up. Um, so thanks for bearing with me on that one. Uh, this week we follow, we continue to follow the first missionary journey. Um, last week, Paul and Barnabas and John Mark took off from Antioch down to Cyprus where Barnabas was from, and they had a pretty fruitful ministry there to the point that when they came to Paphos, of course, they, the governor wanted to see them and see what all the fuss was about. Well, after uh, they finished up in Cyprus, they, they sailed north, make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself. Yes, they, they set sail from Paphos up to Perga, and we see that in verse 13. But at that point, something happens. John Mark pulls the parachute, and at that point, and he goes home to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is down here, so he would have landed here and, and, and continued on to Jerusalem by foot. Um, now, it, it, seems that it, it says it nicely there, but we actually find out later in Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas have a dispute about John Mark having left them at this point. Paul felt that John Mark, or sorry, that, that John Mark had faithlessly deserted them at this point. That's what the, the, the I like that's how the NIV renders it in Acts 15. Um, I think the fact that but John Mark faithlessly deserted them, friends, speaks to how difficult this mission was. This wasn't a happy-go-lucky skip across Cyprus, even though Cyprus was beautiful. There was lots of rejection. There's lots of kilometers. There's also some success. But I can just imagine John Mark gets through Cyprus, looks at the rest of the map, and just realizes he doesn't have it in him. And he heads home. Uh, I remember on basic training, one of the things we do in basic training, I, I used to train on it, I went through basic training twice, is we would blast you with kilometer after kilometer after kilometer of forced marches. We'd get you up early, we'd keep you up late, and you'd look at that schedule and realize, this is my life for the next three months. And those first few weeks usually weeded out the people who either didn't have it in them or they just didn't want to be there. I remember one individual, uh, her dad had sent her on basic training. That was her only motivation for being there. She literally, like, literally had to be carried on marches with one, one person on, under one side, one person under the other. Friends, a forced march is hard enough without having to carry someone along with you. Uh, obviously, she didn't make it in, even through the first week, right? Because the motivation wasn't there, nor was the ability to get through. Uh, so Jean-Marc, I think that's kind of what's going on with Jean-Marc here. He looks at the, at the map, and he's like, nope, I'm not going to be able to make it. Uh, they actually don't stay long in Perga. That's not where they're, they're aiming to go to. They move on up to Antioch in Pisidia, verse 14 says. Now that is, if you look at your Bible, that's two verses, right? It's, it's very easy to read, but what I want us to realize is that this is actually a very dangerous 100-mile journey over the mountains, okay? I can just almost wonder if Jean-Marc was sailing up and saw the mountains coming, and thought to himself, no. I chose the wrath of Paul over the wrath of a hungry mountain lion or a bandit on the highway, that's where we, or a highwayman as we call them. Friends, what we're talking about here, it sounds nice on the page, but this was a man's mission. This was not for little boys. And at this point, for some reason in the faith and perhaps even in life, John Mark was a little boy. This was for the men to continue on with. Now, where they arrive is a different city than Big Antioch. Uh, there was a king who was just after the time of, of uh, Alexander the Great. He became king, but he was also a special individual and decided he was going to name 16 cities after his father. So there are 16 Antiochs in the ancient world. So sometimes, even in the New Testament, it can start to get a little bit confusing for us. Uh, it's kind of like Halliburton years ago before they changed all the names of the road. There were three or four different Peterson roads. Do you remember that? There was a Peterson road everywhere you drove in Halliburton. If you had a 911 call and you lived on Peterson Road, good luck. <laughs> Hopefully they got the right one. Antioch is kind of like that. This is Pisidian Antioch, not Big Antioch, which was the third biggest city in the, in the or second or third biggest city in the empire. They moved, they've gone up there. It's a small border city. 
uh, kind of within in the Galatian area that they were trying to minister to. Uh, they arrive, and they do what they always do first. They go to the Jewish synagogue. And if we look at verse 15, uh, they're in the middle of this, uh, this, this uh, what we would probably consider more like a prayer service for us. There's, uh, there's prayer going on, there's a reading of the word, and there's some teaching. Uh, apparently, Paul and Barnabas are recognized as rabbis. It's entirely possible they recognize who Paul is. Paul was, was, was a very important scholar, upcoming scholar at that time. And he was from Tarsus, so they might have even recognized who Paul was. So they're given the floor to speak, which is a big deal. You know, if I was to say, hey, you know, such and such a person who no one in the room knows, why don't you come on up and speak? I better know who that person is and what it is that they're about to say. And so Paul gets up, he raises his hand, and then he lets loose, and we get a window into how Paul shared the gospel. And friends, basically, he tells God's big story. We're doing a Sunday school uh, Sunday school program now in the, with Amy's doing with the kids and the teachers can be going called God's Big Story, understanding where we fit within God's big story and what God wants to do through us. He starts by talking about the story of Israel. You can see that in verses 16 to 25. Then he talks about how the story of Israel, the story of the Old Testament, points to Jesus. Verses 26 to 37, and the salvation that comes only through Jesus. And then he calls for a response, we see, from verses 38 to 41. It is wonderful. I just re recommend that you read through that uh, once again after, after you get home tonight or this afternoon. And by him, verse 39 says, he ends with this, by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. That's a focus for us. I want us to keep that, that verse right there in our minds to understand the depth of what Jesus has freed us from and to live in the love of God. That is our focus, to understand the depth of what Jesus has freed us from and what he's freed us to. And then if we look on to verse 43, it's actually very interesting to me. There's something very interesting. This is our main exegetical point for the sermon right here. Very interesting to me that the converts to Judaism were the ones who always followed Paul and Barnabas the most. Some of the regular, the regular Jewish people, but especially the converts and, and the, the pagans who were, who were a pagan adherents. They were known as the converts. They were known through the Bible as the devout pagans. So these are people who are Gentiles. They're not uh, of the race of Israel, but they've heard the call of the living God of the universe over the call of all these smaller gods that are all around them and all the pagan gods of everyday life and they've, they've, they've turned to the living God of the universe as found and who speaks through the people of Israel, this small people of Israel. And so they're welcomed into the worship of a synagogue within the city, but they weren't really Jewish people. They're still Gentiles. They weren't really the chosen ones, nor would they ever really be Jewish. They loved God. They recognized the God of the Bible, but they were always kept one step away from him. That's who followed Paul's teaching. That's who felt the call of the living God when Paul spoke. They rejoice at the news that they could come to God finally and totally through the Spirit because of Jesus. This was amazing, life-giving news to them. They had been kept far and now they were being brought near. And it seems like a small exegetical nugget, friends, but if we look at Luke-Acts, this is an important theme that runs through the entire Bible, through Luke and Acts, and I, I would say through all the rest of the Gospels. The outsider, the one who feels farthest from God, is the one brought near through Jesus. Think about the Roman centurions in the Gospel of Luke. Think about the leper, Think about the tax collector, the traitor to Israel, brought near, attracted to Jesus. Luke uses the term son of man for Jesus 80 times through his gospel and through Acts. He is the true servant of all humanity. He wasn't the son of Israel as much as he was the son of man. In God's big story, the misfits 
always seem attracted to Jesus. And if we're honest, there's a child in every one of us who feels like a misfit, who feels far from a lovable by God. And friends, I'm not just talking about those of us who are unbelievers. This is a temptation for, self, for Christians to self-exclude from a deeper relationship with God because maybe we, we just don't feel like we're up to it, like we've cleaned ourselves up enough to go deeper and to let God know us better. The invitation to go deeper into our spirituality is an invitation to be loved deeper in the real places of challenge in our lives and welcomed warmer by our Heavenly Father. And this was compelling for the Greek converts. It was the answer to what their hearts had been crying for, what they were searching, why they went to the synagogue, even though they were kept away week after week after week because their hearts were crying for this. And they beg, the passage says, to hear more the next Sabbath. They beg them, please return. Tell us more of this message. And they follow him through them throughout the week. And obviously, they've shared with their friends because what happens? The next week, the whole city shows up the next Sabbath. The whole city shows up. Where are we at? 44. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord, the whole city. And are the leaders happy? They're not happy. The leaders are jealous. They're jealous of Paul, it says in verse 45, but also, I think, it, they're, as same, same with the, all the, the kind of religious elites before them, they are jealous of their place as God's special people. You need to be careful of that. Jesus talked about that. They were jealous of their place as God's special people. That the Christians would open the sanctuary of the living God to, out, to outsiders was a hard no. The religious impulse to exclude is strong. To exclude others, but I would also argue to exclude ourselves because we think we're not clean enough to be before God. Paul and Barnabas basically just brush aside the leaders with a quote from Isaiah, and they head out to minister to the Gentiles. Um, in verse 48 and 43. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing, glorifying the Lord, word of the Lord. And as many who were appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was spreading through the whole pagan nation. Now, it's very hard, it's very easy for me and very easy for us in the, in the, in the New Testament to go hard at the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders. But I think we need to understand it wasn't just the Jewish system that was excluding people. All right? It's not like this was the only religious system at that time that was, that was oppressing people and keeping them down. The entire Roman belief system, friends, take it to the next slide, please. The entire Roman belief system was systemically oppressive. It was designed to keep the people in power, in power, and to keep those at the bottom, at the bottom, worshiping who? The emperor. The entire Greek system itself as well, was systemically oppressive. So the message of justification by faith alone was very compelling to the average Gentile, especially the Gentile who left that pagan system because they knew there was something true in this biblical faith, and they came there, but they're still kept away, and then they're told, no, you can meet the living God through Jesus. Very compelling. The idea that one could be accepted by God outside of politics that she could be accepted by God outside of a sacrificial cult or outside of legalistic rule following. This was life-giving for the average Gentile. Their, their very culture was oppressive. Just to understand that there were cultural hall monitors everywhere in the Roman world. Cultural hall monitors that wanted to keep the rabble in line and did so at the point of a sword. And then here comes Jesus don't need any of that to be welcomed by God. You just need faith in Jesus. And you have welcome to the throne of grace. And of course, the people love it. The cultural hall monitors hate it. Both the pagan and the Jewish cultural hall monitors, and they chase Paul and Barnabas off. But the disciples in verse 52, are they disappointed? They are filled with joy in the Spirit because, friends, Jesus has entered the city. Whether Paul and Barnabas are there or not, Jesus has entered the city, 
and he's there to stay. And the people can know the living God no matter who they are or what's gone on in their lives. Now, to me, this matters a lot for us at West Guilford Baptist, 2023, January. Because feeling like a misfit and feeling pushed to the side isn't just a first century pagan thing. It isn't just a Gentile thing. I was reminded this week of Psalm 42.7. It's actually by our book that we're going to be reading next month. And the psalmist in, verse four, in, in Psalm 42 is crying out to God. He feels forgotten. He feels like he's just he's reached the bottom. And he cries out. And what he cries out, he says, The deep calls to the deep. I don't know exactly what that means. This cry from deep inside us. I don't know exactly what it means, but I feel it. Do you feel that? What that means? It's not something I think we know with our minds. That's, our, that's a soul calling out to God. The deep calls to the deep of the universe. That resonates. The real, raw, deep places of our hearts cry out to the deep of the living God. We spoke about prayer last week. Prayer becomes real when we let the honest parts of our hearts call out to God. When we aren't pretending under some veneer of wax, spiritual wax we try to build up on ourselves. Like we have to clean ourselves up and be polite. Worship and prayer become real. Worship and prayer become real friends when we are sincere. We are without wax. We even bring our sins, the deepest, darkest sins, before God and to the cross. So we have a to-do, I think. I think we need to pray and worship more like honest pagans than religious pretenders. The most indescribably intimate moments with my wife are times when I'm open and vulnerable about what's going on with me, and Amy is open and vulnerable about what's going on with her. That's where real intimacy happens in a relationship. When we break down the fake veneer of everything's just okay and we really connect, God wants that connection with you. He wants to connect with the real you, not some tidied up version that's cleaned itself up enough for him that you can pray. I suppose I'm inviting you friends to be honest with God this week. Share the worst stuff. If resentment about in, is in your heart for how life has been to you, come to God as someone who's resentful. Hold the resentment up to him through Jesus. Don't pretend. It's forgiven in Jesus. Now we just need to let God deal with it over and over again as we grow. If you're in pain, friend, if you're in grief, if you've had trauma, Come to God who's someone who's in pain, who's in grief, who's had trauma. Pour it out. Pour it out. Be real this week. Jesus said, what did he say? Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. One step further. Maybe you just don't feel like praying today. That happens. Tell God that too. Don't even pretend. Tell God that too. Life is too short and there's too much grace for us to be anything but our authentic, sincere, real selves before the throne of grace. The deep calling to the deep. Then our faith becomes real. And even when we don't know what or how to pray, Romans says the Spirit itself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So there's that deep again groanings too deep. That's what attracted the pagan misfits to Jesus. If that's where the misfit inside of you finds forgiveness, finds healing, and finds the deepest love of the universe. And sanctification by the power of the Holy Spirit because Jesus, in Jesus, we can come as we are to be changed in ways we didn't know possible. Amen? I'm going to invite uh, one of the ushers to go downstairs and welcome the kids back up. I always forget to do that. I'm going to be so proud that I remember to do that. And we go to our big finish. Uh, I've been channeling this book this morning a little bit. 
For those who are going to be do, who are interested in doing our book study next week, it's called "Where Prayer Becomes Real" by Strobel and uh, and and Co. I've read Kyle Strobel's stuff before. Uh, I actually am really enjoying this book. So if you, there was enough folks who were interested in going through a book next month, we'll go through it, we'll read it, and uh, either Amy and I will host you at our place, or we'll, depending on how many people are doing it, we might come here and we'll just have a discussion, like a book of the month club, but talking about prayer. So if, you, uh, if you're interested, please sign up. I'll put a sign-up sheet out on the table outside there. The book should cost less than $20. But what I want to do is this. I want us to buy the books here at West Guilford Baptist, and then we'll let you know how much it cost us, and you pay us what you can afford. I do not want cost to keep you from being a part of what we're doing next month, if you're interested. Okay, so it'll get covered, so sign up for it, and then we'll let you know how much it costs. I'm talking with Kathy on Tuesday. She's away visiting family, so I don't know exactly when I can get them for, uh, but I'm going to go to Masters, and we're going to order them through her uh, so that we buy locally. Again, don't let the cost deter you. Uh, let's study together. I'm really enjoying it, so I think you will too. Uh, let's pray together. Loving God, I give you thanks that we have access to the throne of grace no matter who we are, Lord God. I pray that as we sing this last worship song, we would bring to for, before you our real selves, everything that's going on, Lord God, and we would pray and we would worship as people who are broken, people who are sinful, but most of all, people who are redeemed and accepted through the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. I invite the worship team to come forward.
Monday, but I say it's going to be blessed Monday tomorrow. A blessing on you this week, and I pray the benediction, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and with all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. God bless you all. Have a great week, everybody.